Merry Christmas. Welcome to worship at Abiding Hope Church. We're so thankful that you could join us on this celebration of the Christ coming close and being near to us, Emmanuel. Uh, as you join us in worship, we're thankful to have you. And as a part of Abiding Hope, we always believe that the table is extended from our place into every place around the world. So we invite you to have bread and wine or grape juice available for that time in our worship when we share and celebrate communion together. Just a few notes as we begin. Uh, want to remind you that as you have end of the year gifts, we want you to think of two things. First, one of the big pushes we have here at Abiding Hope is to be thinking about those people in need at this time. We support a ministry called Shemin Lavi Mio. That means a pathway to a better life. A $2,000 gift creates a microloan program that helps a woman be raised up from abject poverty into sustainable living. It coaches them to learn how to create a job, a, a life, a sustainable life for them. It gives them a home, a clean water, and provides exactly what they need. The, the gift is to see these women go from a place where they can't even look you into the eye to where they can hold themselves up and proud. It costs that $2,000 gift, but every amount counts. So we invite you to give a gift today to Shemin Lavi Mio. Send it right here to Abiding Hope, and we'll make sure it gets to the HTF Foundation, which then pushes our gift towards that program. Also, as we uh, come to the end of the year, we want to invite you to catch up on your giving if you are behind. Uh, just make that gift to us through abidinghope.org slash give before midnight of December 31st. Welcome to worship.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Christ, your coming was unexpected but beautiful news for the whole world. For in your coming, you reminded us that you are near, Emmanuel. As we reflect tonight on all the news that we have been given, the unexpected ways in which you have shown us your presence, open our hearts to see you again, that we might be surprised by the gift that you have been to all of humanity. Holy God, come again to us this evening in flesh, in blood, and remind us that you are near, sharing with us the good news that we are free and that love and life win. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. About that time, Caesar Augustus ordered a census to be taken throughout the empire. This was the first census when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Everyone had to travel to his own ancestral hometown to be accounted for. So Joseph went from the Galilean town of Nazareth up to Bethlehem in Judah, David's town, for the census. As a descendant of David, he had to go there. He went with Mary, his fiancée, who was pregnant. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. She gave birth to a son, her firstborn. She wrapped him in a blanket and laid him in a manger, because there was no room in the hostel. I thought I was done having babies. At one point we had three boys under the age of four, and I'll tell you what, it was intense. I wanted a big family, at least four kids, and I remember Jay and I talking and him telling me, well, I think you're gonna have to want one more than I don't. Well, that kind of sealed the deal. And I remember exactly where I was on the dam over Lake Murray in South Carolina, where I really began to process this and understand that that was no longer part of my identity. Having, um, being pregnant and having babies was no longer where my world was going. And so I had to shift and understand that this new identity I needed to lean into had to change. And so I began to get really involved in paddle boarding, started to do some competitive paddle boarding. And I even started a special Olympics paddle boarding team there on Lake Murray. It was a lot of fun and I really enjoyed it. Uh, right around about the end of March, beginning of April, uh, um, we had a big shift and change in our lives. I was 41 or 40 years old and found out that I was pregnant with Eden. What a surprise. Even more surprising is that it was on April 1st. And I remember telling Jay on April Fool's Day that I was pregnant with Eden. And he said, wow, what an April Fool's. And I told him, honey, this is not an April Fool's. We sat around and we uh, told the boys that they were all gonna become big brothers to another sibling. And the joy that came across their face um, at the idea of welcoming another little human into our family was indescribable and the best surprise we could have ever asked for. There were shepherds camping in the neighborhood. They had set night watches over their sheep. Suddenly, God's angel stood among them and God's glory blazed around them. They were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I'm here to announce a great and joyful event that is meant for everybody worldwide. A savior has just been born in David's town, a savior who is Messiah and master. This is what you're to look for, a baby wrapped in a blanket and lying in a manger. At once, the angel was joined by a huge angelic choir singing God's praises. Glory to God in the heavenly heights. Peace to all men and women on earth who please God. I wasn't a shepherd, but I was keeping watch over the flock by night. If by flock you mean the people that lived in the city that I was sworn to serve and protect. I started working as a police officer when I was 21 years old. And for most of my career, I worked the graveyard shift from 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. And I loved it. It was hard and often thankless work, but I loved the challenge, the excitement, the people that I worked with, and the opportunity to make a difference. Honestly, I kind of fell into law enforcement. When I started college, I thought I was going to be a pastor, but by the time I was ready to graduate, I no longer felt that same call to public ministry. 
Instead, I went to the police academy and I felt like I was a fish in the water. It was a really good fit. I loved my life. I worked with awesome people, the pay was great, and I was good at it. I was once named female police officer of the year, but it didn't last. Like the shepherds in the field, there was something pulling me away from the life and the work that I knew. Randy and I had connected with this awesome church. It was one of the first things that we did together when we were dating. And we were getting more and more involved, primarily leading the youth group. The more time I spent at church, the more clear it became. The life that I loved was about to be interrupted and upended. Long story short, I left the police department to start seminary 1,200 miles away. And again, like the shepherds, I was so afraid. I left my work, my home, my friends, my family, my husband, everything I knew to follow God's call. And this time I felt like a fish out of the water. My first week at seminary, I sent a card back to my old teammates at the police department. The card had a black and white picture of sheep on the front, except one of the sheep was wearing a colored bow tie. And the card said, adding to my misery, no one here thinks I'm funny. That's what it felt like. I was the odd person out. It was a big adjustment moving from law to gospel, but it was the right decision. Now again, like the shepherds, I get to be the one glorifying and praising God, telling everyone what God has done in the person of Jesus and what a gift that's been. So yeah, thank God for holy interruptions. As the angel choir withdrew into heaven, the shepherds talked it over. Let's get over to Bethlehem as fast as we can and see for ourselves what God has revealed to us. They left, running, and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in the manger. Seeing was believing. They told everyone they met what the angels had said about this child. All who heard the shepherds were impressed. Mary kept all these things to herself, holding them dear, deep within herself. The shepherds returned and let loose glorifying and praising God for everything they had heard and seen. It turned out exactly the way they'd been told. The shepherds left the manger with the wonderful job of going to share good news. Um, as a family medicine physician, I often have the job of sharing news with people, I see them in a lot of different spaces, so sometimes it's good news and sometimes it's bad news. But today I'm here to talk about a time when I got to share unexpected good news with someone. So this is a patient I took care of for a long time who had lots of chronic medical problems. Um, she'd struggled for a long time to get her health into a good place and was actually finally doing really well. Um, but she was coming in to see me because unfortunately she was not doing very well anymore. She'd had a lot of her stomach problems come back. and She was nauseous all the time and was just very, very discouraged that she had started having these symptoms again after doing so well for so long. So we sat down in my office and talked about things and listening to her story, I started feeling like there might be something else going on. So I ran some lab work um, and when I came back into my office, I got to share with her the good news that in fact her stomach problems were not back. She was in fact pregnant and she was just overjoyed to hear this news because after being sick for so long, she had been worried that she was never going to be able to get pregnant. So to be able to share with her that instead of being sick again, she was going to have a child was an amazing experience. And it was wonderful for me as someone who shares all kinds of news to share with someone something really wonderful and be a bearer of joy for her. Maybe you've heard it said, humans plan and God laughs. Isn't that so true? We in our society today think that we can plan life. We can organize it, we can structure it, we can schedule it out, and things will happen the way we plan. But that's foolish thinking. That's not how life works. In fact, life isn't meant to be controlled or managed. Life is meant to be experienced. And when God breaks into our world, it's always in unexpected ways. It's never the way we want. It's never the way we're ready for. It's never the way that we can actually say yes to right away because it's scary. The kinds of things that God calls us into frighten the daylights out of us because God stretches our limits. God can see more in us than we can see in ourselves. Even when Jesus came into this world, he wasn't the Messiah that people were expecting. 
the religious leaders, the, the power brokers, even the poor were expecting a Messiah who was going to come with great political and military might and power. They expected a Messiah who would become the king of all the people. He would chase out the oppressors and raise Israel to a, a place of high status. But that's not who Jesus came to be. He didn't come to lord over people. He came to love. He came to show us who we are as children of God. He came to remind us that we exist not to dominate, not to be in charge, but to be a blessing. That our lives are intended to be blessings in the lives of other people and blessings in this world. These stories that we, we heard tonight, all of them have fear involved. New, new things happening, change happening in people's lives that they weren't ready for, they didn't quite expect. And once it happened, they didn't quite know what to do about it. But in each of these stories, we heard good news. Good news of how God broke in. Good news of how once they were past their fear, they could see the blessing in and through and around themselves. And that's who we're called to be as Christmas people. We're called to be people who expect the unexpected. We're called to be people who, who recognize that regardless of what we're experiencing in life, whether it's good or bad, our identity doesn't change as children of God. People who recognize that when things feel really dark, when, when fear seems to surround us and, and fill us, we're part of a God of life, a God who creates, a God who recreates. Think of the story of Jesus' death on the cross. It was a horrible day. It was a horrible situation where it looked like the power structures, the powers that be at the time of Jesus, they had the last word. He didn't fight back. There was nothing he could do as he was arrested by the Romans, as nails were driven through his hands and his feet. But he didn't give in to fear. He didn't curse back those who were doing this to him. He didn't call down legions to, to fight on his behalf. He surrendered, trusting that love and life would win. He trusted that even though these horrible things were happening to him, he was dwelling in the hands, even in the heart of God. And on the third day after Jesus' crucifixion, the most unexpected thing happened. God raised him from the dead. Who would have planned that? Who would have put that in their calendars? Who would, have, who would have thought that that is how the outcome would be? No one. Even though Jesus had been telling his disciples, he had been telling his followers this would happen, it was though they had never heard it because they didn't act as though they expected it. They ran in fear and hid when he was crucified. But it was the women was the women who came to the tomb. They came to anoint his body. They weren't expecting the resurrection either, but they were there. And because they showed up, because they faced their fears and came to that tomb, they got to be the very first ones to experience and tell the story of this unexpected thing that God had done. He had raised Jesus. And so we are God's Christmas people. We are God's resurrection people. We're called every single day to have our eyes open for the unexpected things that God is doing in and around us. But you know, when we have our, our faces always in our calendars, when we have our faces always in our, in our devices, our digital devices, it's hard to look around. It's hard to see the unexpected. But not only are we called to see the unexpected in our own lives, we're called to be vessels of hope and joy and peace in the lives of others. Very often when we're going through difficult, painful times, we, it's not in those moments that we can see God breaking through. And that's why we're called to come alongside one another and to hold each other and to walk alongside one another, reminding each other, God is here. You are a child of God. The darkness doesn't have the last word. Light does. Love does. Life does. And so in John's gospel, when it says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot overcome it, it can only 
get that through a lens of faith, a lens of trust that the same God who who brought Jesus into this world through Mary, the same God who, who was there with Jesus as he engaged in his ministry and gave him the power of the Holy Spirit, the same God that was with Jesus as he suffered on the cross, and the same God who raised Jesus from the dead, that God's with you, that God loves you, that God holds you and stands with you, and that God promises that the dark won't win. So I pray that this Christmas season, you be someone who is looking, anxiously looking, always looking, being aware of the ways that God is breaking into your life, breaking into this world, breaking into the lives of others in unexpected ways, so that you can point to those signs, those ways that God is showing up to be a vessel of hope and joy and peace in the lives of others. May you and your family have a blessed Christmas and a really, truly blessed new year. God loves each of you, and I do too. Merry Christmas. Peace of the Lord be with you always. I invite you to share a sign of God's peace with others. If there are people with you there in the room, share God's peace with one another. If not, text someone peace or offer a prayer of peace for someone. However you can put peace out into the world, we invite you to do that now. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, 
broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. If you have others there with you, I invite you to commune one another. And if you are communing alone, you're not alone. You commune with us. And we say, this is the body of Christ broken for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. All are welcome to eat and drink these gifts of God because we know that the gifts of God are free. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and keep you. You are forever in God's grace. Amen.
Now receive this benediction. Go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good. Render unto no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord abiding in the comfort of the Holy Spirit. In the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest upon you and remain with you this day and forevermore. Amen. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.